This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by my stupendous, awesome, legendary supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support Shadowversity on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash Shadowversity. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I'm finding that when I do a video reviewing writing samples from my subscribers, I tend to like to make an accompanying video just talking about one of the aspects of writing in general, a companion video, so to speak. And this one, I want to talk about something that uh, I actually mentioned in um, my video, How to Write a Novel, and I said it's its own topic, and so I'll do that topic here, which I hope will be very useful, and I know it's been useful for me, and that's it, that is how to tell if your writing is any good or if indeed it sucks. See, this is one of the great struggles with aspiring writers that I've had to face in the past, because when you write something to the best of your ability, how can you tell if it's wrong? Because if it's the best of your ability, you don't have any greater ability to be able to pick out the mistakes. It's like we've got beer goggles with our own work. And in, and in actual fact, even if you do write something with the best of your ability, sometimes you would be able to pick out the mistakes if you weren't the one to have write, written it. For some reason, we're always able to look at other people's work more objectively and clearer than this thing that we have, only, we have written ourselves. The danger, not, not like f physical danger, but something that would, you know, certainly worries me, is when you write something that you honestly think is really, really good, and uh, you might be feeling so confident that you want to go ahead and publish it. And then if you were to do that, and you continue your writing endeavors and you learn how to write much more and then you go back and you see something that you presented to the public that is not good okay in fact it might be horrible bad, bad terrible you know you might be in a position where you're very embarrassed that you tried to publish something of such inferior quality and I for myself am very very grateful that I had never I've never gone to try and publish my earlier books that I have read that I wrote in the past. One of the ways I avoided this uh, unfortunate, naive assumption of my own ability was that I was trying to get traditionally published. And the advantage to that is to get traditionally published, you need to pass gatekeepers, okay? And uh, you have no choice but to not only, you know, meet standards, but perhaps even exceed them a little bit. And holding myself to that standard actually helped me improve as a writer phenomenally, okay? So I actually think that should be a standard that all writers should try and aim for, especially like even more so to the self-published writers, is to try and hit, hit a professional set. You want to produce something professional, but then how do you know what is professional? Well, there's a couple of things that will help you out and that have helped me out. Of course, one of the ways is to have someone look at it who actually knows how to write. This can be tricky because where can you find someone who knows how to write. I, on occasion, offer that service to my subscribers, which I've just done in conjunction with this video. But then what do I do? How do I know if I can write? Well, I can do the same thing. Try and send my work to other people that I have confidence to know how to write and see if they think that it is passable. And that's about where I'm at. I, I can write at, two, uh, in terms of my prose, okay? My prose is, I, I can say with a certain level of confidence, is at least passable. I actually don't think my prose is... Uh, stupendous or good. My strengths lie in dialogue, so that part of prose, my dialogue is actually much, much better, as well as setting plot and character, okay? The, 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 the bricks and can, you know, the foundation for story. And that works perfectly fine for me. I'm actually very happy with that. It's not to say I'm not going to try and improve, I certainly will, but there are some people who are just poets, and I am not a poet. The thing is though, you might not always have access to people who know how to write, who will constantly be there, ready and willing to look at your stuff. And if you're working through a writing group with people who are still trying to learn the craft and it's kind of on the same level as you, it might be a bit harder to get more objective feedback to improve. So one of the other ways, and this is kind of one of the big ones that I feel can really, really help uh, you figure out if your writing is any good, is constantly try and get better at it. Always try and improve. And so when I say that, study, okay? So to this day, I still participate and listen to, so when I say participate, I'm not there physically, but I'm listening to them online, writing workshops, okay? Uh, you know, Brandon Sanderson, he posts his writing, you know, lectures that he does in university online. You can do it for free. That's like a university education on creative writing for free. It's great stuff. Listening to writing podcasts and other successful writers on the craft to try and learn about doing this. Uh, something that also is particularly useful in terms of working out the nuts and bolts of writing is uh, looking up like editors. There's a, there's a couple of 
actual qualified editors who make YouTube videos to just talk about pros specifically, like little uh, you know, words that you should cut from your manuscript and things like that, words that don't really help out at all, mistakes in writing convention that you should avoid, and the correct ways to try and structure sentences and stuff like that, they're a wealth of help and knowledge and a resource for free online. I'll link some in the description down below. And then if you're continually trying to improve and continuing, you know, try, I get better as a writer, you will invariably be able to go back to your old works. So not the thing that you're currently writing, because the thing you're currently writing is generally going to be the thing that's written to your best ability. But you go back to your previous thing, okay? Or something that you wrote a month ago, even more, half a year or whatever, and have a look and see how many mistakes you can pick out. And if you can pick out far less, okay, you might have better, you know, hopes or a better, you know, ability to say that, okay, maybe I am getting there. Maybe my writing doesn't suck as much as I feared. The thing is though, for me, when I was doing this, uh, I had to do it <laughs> in snippets, okay? Because you could only absorb so much. And this is the, the next thing, okay? And this is, this is the tricky thing. All these different, you know, uh, techniques of writing uh, effective or even passable prose and stuff like that can be very hard to remember. Uh, it can be too much. And so to, you want to you know, work on it and, and incorporate it to the point where it becomes reflex. And so for what I had to do is I would be trying to study and learn better. And when I hear something that I'm not doing, okay, and I know not because they're describing something that I haven't done my writing, I kind of have to pause my study there and say, all right, I need to go back to what I've worked on and fix it, okay? And so I remember when I learned the actual difference in such a way that I understood explicitly the difference between third person limited and third person omniscient. And not just in a kind of textbook de uh, de a way of describing, I was actually understanding in a way that you can work your descriptions as a narrator from the perspective of your character and switch it up. So if it's a different point of view, then you would be describing things as the narrator in the way that the viewpoint character would be seeing things and stuff like that. And when I learned that, that was a whole rewrite. I needed to rewrite my whole book. The thing is though, if I kept studying and tried to learn all the other things that I didn't know, all right, it would be too much. I Because what I needed to do, I needed to get that thing on reflex to the point where when I write now, writing from correct viewpoint in the lens of the character in third person limited is now instinctive and I don't need to worry about it, which means I can then start to focus on other things that I need to get better at, okay? It's all a matter of trying to get these technical little things, you know, in the writing convention and stuff like that, reflex, instinctual, so you don't have to worry about it, and then you can focus on what really matters is the story, okay? Setting plot characters, get that all, you know, working well. But this is what I mean, when you go back to stuff that you've previously written and you can see that you are not doing something that you should, or you're making a big mistake that you shouldn't do, that is one way to be able to tell if your writing sucks, or if it's any good. Continually try and learn. And so for me, yeah, I went back, realized, oh, third person limited. I am breaking out and omniscient all the time. Complete rewrite. Rewrite my whole book. And uh, oftentimes that led to recontextualizing it, rewriting a, like a prequel version. It's funny, my story of all these, uh, you know, preparatory kind of practice books that I wrote. There's a funny story about it. Maybe I'll do a video on it. I find it funny. I remember one time I realized that uh, a main character, which is a crucial character through the entire book, was horribly two-dimensional. Really, really two-dimensional. And uh, I gave her an accent which made her sound very stupid, like she was a simpleton and everything wasn't right up there. She just did not work at all. And so I not had I didn't I couldn't just change her. I needed to throw her out and insert a new character with that name. And guess what? I had to rewrite the whole book once again. <laughs> Luckily, there are some things that you'll learn that won't require a whole rewrite, but it will require a full revision from start to end uh, to fix things up. For instance, using uh, words that are ultimately redundant and pointless, and you can cut most of them, from, like the word that, okay? That is a word that you can cut most of its use in a full manuscript. But not only that, there are overuse of adverbs like very and really. And that's my own particular weakness right there because <laughs> trust me, you could go to any of my videos and you will see, hear me use really and very. Like this is really cool and it is very dear. I adverb my natural way of speaking all the time and so that seeps into my writing a lot. And <laughs> so when I, when I realized that, hmm, I'm using these words way too much. 
did uh, on you know Microsoft Word did a search for that and very every single instance of me using those words I looked at every and that was thousands right so I had to go through every single instance of me using those words to see if sometimes they do fit, sometimes uh, that word can work. Most of the time they don't and they can be cut completely and you can make the sentence more efficient, snappy uh, and just better. And then there are words like started and begin, uh, like so-and-so started to get up. No, you don't need to write that. So-and-so stood up, right? <laughs> like he, he started to walk down the road or you could say, he walked down the road or he made his way forward to wherever he's, he's going, right? Explaining negative information. So-and-so saw nothing. I So-and-so could, couldn't hear a thing. That's explaining something. Now, like, so replace it with uh, uh, something that actually builds the scene. Like, you know, maybe the silence seemed to ring or something like that. You know, when something is so silent that it's unnatural, you, know, you can try and explain the way the silence is instead of just saying you're hearing silence because you can't really hear silence. Silence is a nothing. So all these things are just little examples amongst, oh, gee, there's hundreds of them. And I wouldn't be able to list them all because the other thing is the more you write, okay, and especially if you read and listen and other things like that, you're going to start to develop, uh, if, you're to, if you're always trying to work and get better at it, you're going to start to develop these things instinctually without actually needing to learn some of them. For instance, trying to use a more active voice instead of passive voice and uh, realizing that each scene, even though written in past tense, has a past, present and future from the perspective of the scene, I realized I was starting to do that instinctually and no one ever had to tell me explicitly that, uh, you know, this is how you do it. And for instance, there's past tense, but then there's past perfect. And so past perfect tense is when you're describing something in the past of the present uh, like point in time of that scene. See, there you go. And I didn't, I like someone told me, uh, I was watching this video where someone described past perfect. And I was like, I've never heard of past perfect. Am I, am I doing something wrong? And I went back and was like, oh, I am doing it. Thank goodness. <laughs> and ha ha, how to tell if your writing sucks or not. When you start to learn these things and you go back and you realize, Wow, I'm, I'm actually doing that. You might be able to have a bit more credibility to say that your writing is passable. For myself, where I'm currently at, I'm not satisfied that my prose is passable. I want to get my prose good. So I continually try and improve. But if you can get to the passable state, well, then you might be able to have something you would be less embarrassed to publish and present to the world. And, and if it's passable, in fact, maybe good, all right, if you're actually able to write something that when someone reads, they don't, it isn't confusing and things are flowing well and you're able to pace the scene in the exact way that the scene needs and other things like that, you might be able to write something that not only one person, but maybe a lot of people might really enjoy. Unfortunately, I've only been able to speak more specifically in regards to prose in this video and being able to tell if your writing sucks or not because there's a whole other component to writing. This is only half of it, which is actually the story, which is comprised out of the plot, setting and characters. And even if you can do beautiful, poetic prose and you just can't write a story worth a damn, well, then you're going to be in trouble too, which I guess will be another subject for a video for me to address. Because there is a lot in regards to that, like, you know, avoiding plot holes, making believable characters, characters, good dialogue that feels natural but it uh, is also efficient in its own way. How to set a scene in an engaging way. How can you make a scene that is essentially boring, someone walking into a shop to buy something or someone coming to someone's home to describe, I don't know, a, a good example. I've been recently rereading Brandon Sanderson's uh, Alloy of Law series, the Wax and Wayne series. So the, sorry, the Alloy of Law is the first book. And there's a scene where a character is coming to describe an arrangement marriage. This could be an extremely boring and just bad scene because there's someone talking about an, exchange, uh, an arranged marriage but gee the way he wrote that scene is just beautiful where one character he made a character really interesting and quirky and different and so the things he was proposing was kind of strange and comical in its own way but separate to this you have uh, the main character has a friend who is there in disguise trying to describe to the or trying to <laughs> basically recruit the main character to, to research this crime or mystery that's going on and the way that is doing it subtly so there's two narratives going in the same scene where they describe an arranged marriage, yet they're also talking about this strange mystery that's going on with, you know, these uh, 
bits of evidence left behind being shown and also the fact that this character is in disguise and only other character knows it. So you have this multi-layered engaging scene that could be extremely boring but is thoroughly entertaining and so there's just that's just one like element of doing the story and pacing and structuring a scene in the correct way that's completely separate to prose that can determine if your book is engaging and enjoying to watch. So th there's a lot to it and I've only been speaking about that. But that's another thing, okay? If you can learn about those elements of writing, okay? Good plot, okay? Pacing, character, how to make, is a scene boring or not? And then you can look back and if you're seeing problems in the stuff that you've written, you know, not very long ago, especially if you can point out the things in the current one, you know that uh, your writing might not be there yet. And so the answer is, continually learn, try and improve constantly, all right? And then constantly look at your stuff and uh, if you see problems with it, work on it better. And then if you start to see less problems, and then if you see problems that you're able to fix, and then you see, you know, uh, problems that are just, uh, you know, could be fixed in post-editing maybe and stuff like that, and you, you've polished it as much as you can, well then you might have something that's a bit closer or worthy to be submitted to agents or maybe even go to self-publishing. So there you go guys, that's uh, what I wanted to share on that, the, the little tools that I've used throughout the uh, 10 years that I've been trying to learn how to write, and the things that have helped me be able to determine more objectively, and level than I wasn't in the past to see if uh, I'd feel more confident to uh, publish something that would be consumed by people in the world and stuff like that. And what's interesting about when I make these writing videos, I do get a lot of people asking questions about my book, if I am published and other things like that. And so I'll just try and quickly answer them here to get a bit of a jump on some of the comments down below. And I'll just be brief. In my video, How to Write a Novel, I mentioned I wrote about eight books and most of them was absolute trash. And separate to those eight books, there is one book that I've written, you know, I, well, I finished it a couple, about a year or so ago, and <laughs> I've been spending over a year in revision. Just the editing, the polishing stage, going through all those things, okay, the things that were not instinctual for me, because tell you what, when you write just in what's coming out of your head onto the paper, it can be a mess sometimes and you really need to polish it and fix it up as much as you can. But if you understand enough about the writing, you know, about how to write effectively and stuff, there's hope you can get it get it there. And the thing that was working really well, of course, are the areas that I feel are my strengths, which are you know, plot, setting, character, stuff like that. Very excited about this story. And so uh, this is the one that I'm going forward with uh, self-publishing. It's not published yet. I have just completed having it being sent to beta readers. I announced on my Patreon and on Facebook to people who wanted to be beta readers. Sorry, you guys, you missed out. I didn't announce it in a video. Feedback was awesome, okay, right? And it also helped me just make the, like, it, it's funny. I was very confident that they wouldn't be able to point out anything that was just, bro that the book was broken because I'd learned enough in the writing process. But if they did, I'd have to take it on the chin and go back, but they, they didn't. But they were certainly able to point out things that just would help it out. Like for instance, this is confusing or it would make more sense if something is brought up here. What happens here, it doesn't strike me as authentic to how the character is established. And so, and sometimes those things were easily fixes. And when I say, oh yeah, that's like great feedback with the beta readers. And now I'm in the stages of hiring a copy editor and line editor who will go through and pick up all the little you know adverbs that have slipped under the radar in my own revisions and you know helping me fix up my own inefficient sentences that I'm not able to pick out. I did mention that a pretty good agent had shown interest in my book and requested to see more of it. Uh, unfortunately he chose not to pick up the book and move forward with it and it's interesting because even at that time I was already very strongly considering doing self-publishing but this agent was so cool that it would have been really hard to turn it down. Just to let you know who it was, it was Joshua Bilmes. You don't know, you probably don't know who that is. He is the literary agent of Brandon Sanderson. You know, the Brandon Sanderson that I rave about and say how much I love and reference him all the time. His agent, yeah, that was pretty cool. Showed interest in my book and asked to see more. Interesting thing, which I kind of just do to help me <laughs> prepare my broken heart. I'm joking, but still, rejection. You've got to learn to deal with it. And one of the things, interestingly, is he also turned down Brandon Sanderson many times. Uh, the only way Brandon was able to land Joshua Bilmes is like, he, he's, oh, gee, he's been in this industry for ages and is just a legend. He only picked up Brandon Sanderson when Brandon sent his book Elantris to uh, Tor Publishing separate with no representation, just sent it in and Tor Publishing decided, hey, they like that, they'll pick it up. And so Brandon approached Joshua with a book publishing deal ready to go and that's how he landed him. So it's a hard guy to grab, but anyway, he decided to pass, which of course, you know, uh, and it's so funny, personal preference, uh, uh, even if you have a book that's 
written well and stuff, you just need to find that someone who likes it as much as you, which can be its own problem. With the query letter that I that I settled on, I only sent out five you know, emails with the query letter that got Joshua's attention. It was the last query letter that I had finally finalized. And out of the five I sent, I got two requests to have a look at further material. So the query letter was working, it was a good one. So maybe I'll do a video on how to make query letters in the future. And so with a good query letter, I am confident enough if I just kept on going, I would eventually land an agent. But no, I think self-publishing is the way for me. So that's where I'm at with my book, okay? Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Until then, farewell.